Welcome, one and all, to the mystical world of Felbar. Adventures abound throughout this realm, and we appreciate the opportunity to regale you with some stories from these trails. These accounts are all based on actual RPG experiences that occurred within Adventures in Felbar. Some of these tales may be for mature audiences, while others may be for very immature audiences. We now present the sage Mikas Tumo from Tamel, also known as the Bard of Felbar. Welcome to session Fartuk-22. Our last episode featured Lothar Metal thinking he had a key to escape his shackles, only to discover that it was the wrong key. With the trapdoor below him opening, he was sent down the length of rope where he dangled helplessly. For a few moments it appeared that he would survive, but a guard that he had assaulted also fell through the trap door opening and finished snapping the criminal's neck during the fall. The group spied a pawn shop across the street and introduced themselves to the proprietor, Zamora, and asked her to take a look at the strange box that had started them out on this journey. Sister Elaine nodded to Welby, who withdrew the small box from one of his many pockets and handed it over to the dark and attractive woman. She thanked him and gave him a quick wink, which resulted in his cheeks turning a rosy red color and made him nervous. Please, friends, take a seat, as she pointed to the table and chairs. Pulling back her bag, she sat at the head of the table, examining the trinket. After spinning it around in her slender fingers for several moments, she seemed perplexed. It is finely crafted, possibly made of exotic wood, but polished with a high sheen, possibly elven, as she tipped her head towards Irena and Cabe. I'm not sure, but I think I may have documentation on this item in the back. She handed the cube back to the rogue and told the party she would be right back, and then moved gracefully into the back room. The males exhaled and looked sheepishly at Irena and Elaine, who were giving them stone-cold stares. Could you be any more transparent? She said with a harsh undertone. The men attempted to feign ignorance, but she continued to lambast them under her breath, pointing out that Sister Elaine was sitting with crossed arms, and you three are acting like starstruck schoolboys. Could you try and be a bit professional? You're embarrassing us. The males knew what she meant, and now recovered, F Fargus fumbled through his words in an attempt to exonerate himself. Well, uh, she is, um, and well, her face glows, and, and I mean, you know, her outfit, but stopped when both ladies looked at him like he was an idiot. Fine. She's a pretty lady, a mysterious lady, a lady that could probably... But his voice trailed off as he put a stupid smile back on his face, causing both ladies to throw up their hands in disgust. While Welby also found Zamora attractive, he noticed that he, she had left her bag on the table. Moving the magic box back into a pocket, he began to quickly rifle through the shopkeep's bag with impunity. What are you doing? exclaimed Sister Elaine under her breath. Stop it, you're going to get us all in trouble. Welby stopped for a moment, then stuck out his tongue at the shocked cleric, causing her to glow red in anger. The halfling found something a bit larger than the magic box and brought it out onto the table. It was irregularly shaped and covered in a blue silk scarf. Gingerly, he removed the fine cloth and set the item down in the middle of the table as the others watched. The group leaned in to examine the new trinket and found it to be a glass globe on a small wooden base. A tiny castle was in the center of the globe and it looked extremely realistic. As the group visually examined the item, Fargus cleared his throat. <clears throat> that looks like the lost castle. As the others stared at him, it was clear that they did not know what he was talking about. He shook his head and continued. The lost castle was a stronghold from a couple hundred years ago. Legend has it, it was wiped off the map by magical forces with only a hole where the fortress once stood. It is a story we tell our children where I'm from. As in, if you don't behave yourself, I'll send you to Fitz Keep. He chuckled at the memory, but leaned in. I, 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 I think I just saw something move inside the globe. As the group leaned in closer, Wilby picked up the item and flipped it over, nearly breaking it. 
With everyone on edge, he spotted some writing on the bottom. Huh. Knock three times. I wonder what that means. He quickly flipped the globe over again as everyone gasped. Cabe asked, what, what did you see moving in there? And everyone leaned in again for a more intensive look. Their sight was disruptive as the diminutive rogue repeated the words and gave three solid raps on the fragile globe. A bright light filled the trinket and everyone leaned back from it. Sister Elaine began to scold Welby, but it was too late. Light emanated from the inside of the globe and shot out of the glass in every direction. As the illumination filled the business, each member of the group felt themselves shrinking and falling, being drawn back into the globe itself. A moment later, everyone fell onto a dirt trail facing a broken moat bridge with Fitz Keep on the other side. Ugh, damn it, Welby, what did you do? exclaimed an injured Cabe Silvertongue. The others rose to their feet and looked around. As each was struck in bewilderment, they drew weapons just to be on the safe side. Each member of the party looked around at the surroundings and were uncertain as to what happened. Reaching out behind them, Lady Irena tapped on the unseen glass, pointing out that they were now inside the globe. The party spread out and each felt the invisible wall in front of them, away from the castle side. Looking at the top, they could dimly make out flickering lights from inside the pawn shop. This is so awesome, exclaimed the halfling, who toned it down a bit after noticing his associates were less than thrilled. Bickering broke out, who should have stopped Welby from screwing around until Lady Irena called for silence. What's done is done. Let's work the problem, people. Fargus, you know this place. How do we get out? She asked. His reply was vague and he explained that he always thought it was a tale told to frighten children into being better. He explained that the lost keep was, well, lost. One version stated that wizards had used powerful magic to shrink the stronghold and carried it away in their pocket. As he looked around, he pointed out that this was most likely the case. The group formed a familiar circle and tried to formulate ideas on a resolution. Some felt that perhaps Zamora could rescue them, while others pointed out that she had been tinkering in her bag and would most likely view them as thieves. After a heated discussion, it was decided that they would investigate the ruins of the keep to attempt to find a solution. Broken stones and damaged battlements were obvious from this angle, and the party moved towards the wooden planks over the moat. Hey guys, said a stopped Fargus. I should probably mention one other thing about Fitz Keep. The other stopped and turned to face the ranger who looked concerned. Well, asked Cabe, what is it? <sighs> Fitz Keep is supposed to be haunted, muttered the ranger as he brandished his weapon and walked forward between them towards the bridge. We close out this episode now and give you our thanks for listening. Please subscribe to this podcast and don't forget to follow us on Twitter at The Bards Podcast. For everyone in Adventures of Philbar, thanks for listening.